Welcome, folks, to day 11 of Shelter and Love. For those of you joining for the very first time, I just want to give a quick intro. We were stuck in this shelter-in-place quarantine lockdown around the world, and you guys reached out and said, how can we support each other? Can you offer something in a way that we can see some spiritual perspective and give ourselves some kind of a community in which we can thrive in this, learn something from this, and move forward? And so we created this program called Shelter and Love. And here we are on day 11. I've been bringing in friends from around the world, um, just amazing conversations and meditation. And here I have yet another one of those friends. Tahir Khan is joining us from Karachi in Pakistan. So I want to tell you guys a little bit about how this conversation came about, this inviting Tahir and he being here today. Tahir and I go way back. So it was about 15 years ago, I believe, we met in England. I was in London visiting and we just had this community gathering of meditators and that's where I met with him and we just kind of gravitated we just kind of found each other we just became good friends it's like brothers who had kind of been lost for a long time and uh, we started conversing and every single time I've met with Tahir I have learned something incredible so those of you who know about this program that I've conducted around the world called meditation laboratory that was actually Tahir's idea. I learned that. So once Tahir and I were walking uh, in a mountain uh, retreat center in India, and we had this long walk. At the end of the walk, he kind of inspired me with this new program that he had created, which he had since, by the way, moved from the UK to Pakistan and made that his base. And he created this program called Meditation Laboratory. And at the end of that, I said, Tahir, it's not enough for us to just talk on this walk. We need to sit down and I need you to, I need to record you. So I pulled out my phone, we found an empty conference room and we went on for hours. I think it was like four or five hours and I just kept recording whatever he was saying, came back to America, transcribed it, sent him like a questionnaire of things that gaps that I couldn't understand what he was saying. And then lo and behold, we got this, I had this program in uh, my repertoire called Meditation Laboratory. Now, those of you who've attended some of my meditation sessions and have experienced this thing that I do called micro meditations, Again, Tahir was inspiration behind that. Just an incredibly creative guy, big heart, you know, moving to Pakistan, making that his base for service. I mean, just a fabulous guy. So Tahir, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. So Tahir, so the first thing I want to ask about is the programs, mm -hmm. that incredible array of programs that you've been doing in Pakistan since you've moved there. Number one is the one that touched me the most is a program that you've been doing in schools called Peacetime. I remember you produced a beautiful video and I've shown that video to thousands of my students when I did the meditation laboratory. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a little bit about, you know, the evolution of so the genesis of it. How was this evolved? How was the adapt, uh, adoption of this program and um, what differences it made to people, especially young people? So we, um, it, it goes back, I think 10 years, over 10 years now. So one of the ladies, owners of a school, over here, the school is very much like businesses. So the owner of a school came, came to see us and uh, she went from meditation laboratory program. And she said, I want to do something for the kids. I said, okay, what age group? She said, all. I said, what do you mean all? She said, from kindergarten all the way to 15, 16. And I said, okay. And that was it. That was the idea. And then we came back. We said, how do we do this? How do we capture silence and stillness and make it accessible to children um, in a way that it helps them? So we were looking at um, visualization. We were looking at deeper silence. We were looking to help them with their imagination creativity. So we developed this program where these bite-sized meditations of two and a half minutes, three minutes were played in schools five times a day. So you'd have a bit of meditation. Then after about an hour and a half, you'd have a bit of music and a bit of meditation and a bit of music. This had never been done. It was actually more than a project of just creating um, the meditations. We were actually in the schools working with the staff putting speakers within the school, within all the classrooms. So it was a huge project, the first one that, that went live. And we saw results within one week, two weeks, 
we saw children just become a little bit more still, just a little bit more still. And the teachers could notice this, the staff could notice this. And that was really inspirational. That was inspirational. It's fabulous. And that, that was the beginning, that was the beginning of police time. In fact, uh, Jay, what was more inspirational was when we took this to a, a poor area, the school, the original school that the video that you've shown everyone, that's uh, an English speaking school. We did this in a school that's a very sort of um, very poorer community and it was in a local language. And we realized that these children responded so much quicker because they hadn't been influenced by technology. Their mind was fertile, available for this work. And once again, when they just were given the moments just to be still and be with themselves in a guided way, um, they responded. And so that was the beginning of peacetime in about, about half a dozen schools in the space of about a year. That's fantastic. That think, makes me think of two things that I wanna ask about. So I know you work with children as you've just described, but also the other end of the spectrum, you work with executives and yeah. leaders in the community. Talk to us a little bit about those initiatives. How's the adoption? How do you approach it? And especially, you know, the thing that makes you so different from, the, from many of my other speakers is you are in a geography that is, I would not say that, the, you know, is particularly welcoming and open. I mean, you know, I know it's, I know it is, but this is my perception. This, and this could be my complete, my blind side. So talk to us and tell us about how do you approach it? How do you present it? How's the adoption? And how are people becoming ambassadors to your work? Jay, when I started this in about 2006, it was very heavy going. Um, meditation wasn't very strongly welcomed. You've got to understand that in an Islamic country, uh, their meditation is their prayer, which they offer five times a day. So it was seen initially as going against the grain of what things were done, um, and also something that was straying a little bit away from the religion. So we had to do it very much closed doors. And actually, in that time, a lot of organizations around us closed down because um, there were some people that um, felt this was straying away from the religion. But something really odd happened. In the space of about four or five years, a lot of professionals from abroad, a lot of doctors specifically came back and they'd been trained in alternative medicine in America, in, in UK, and they came back saying to their patients, you need to do meditation. Well, where do we go? And so all of a sudden we had professional people speaking about meditation, which had never been done before. And that was the opening. That was uh, when we said, actually, well, well, we do meditation. But then we had to be very careful that whatever we share with people does not go, uh, it's, it's a religious. It doesn't seem to be uh, attacking um, religion or asking to do something differently to what they practice. Um, Jay, we had a lot of success. We, one of the things that we couldn't do and um, we couldn't advertise because often uh, agencies, the intelligence agencies, they turn up there and you have no idea who's sitting there. Um, and so you've got to be very careful because they want to make sure that you're not doing any, against anything against the grain of society or against the way things are done. Um, we couldn't advertise, we couldn't advertise locally. Everything was done at a very low level. And the way we actually began was friends inviting friends, friends inviting friends. Now, that was a time when the meditation laboratory was created because we realized unless people had an experience, they were not going to tell anyone of it. And I realized people did not want knowledge. They did not want information. Over here in schools at a young age, by the time they're five years old, kids learn the Quran, which is a religious text. So people have had lots of knowledge, lots of information what they needed was experience. And so it was friends inviting friends, inviting friends. As years went by, the, the whole product improved. We became more self-aware. We progressed, the work progressed. 
And then slowly, it wasn't long before prof certain professional people started coming. And now all our lot are professional. We've had CEOs of companies, HR directors of companies that come. Um, we've had cancer turnarounds. So the name has gone out that, you know, what are these people doing that's different? Um, and so, but our criteria is we're very selective now in who we work, who we work with, because uh, we, we encourage other people who come to us have a certain amount of seriousness about themselves. And then it's a joy and a pleasure to work deeper with them. So, so now we, ha we have our med labs now have about 60, 70 people uh, twice a week. We also have public sessions for about 100 people happening twice a week. And uh, we're exploring meditation and making it accessible to everyone. So talk to, talk to us a little bit about that vetting process. How do you determine when somebody is serious or not? Mm -hmm. um, I often, everyone who comes to us for meditation, I make time with everyone. Um, and that's about 20, 25, and it's either online or face-to-face. -face. Sometimes it goes on a little bit longer. And I give them space to hear their story. Um, we work with a lot of people with abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. So I want to give them the space to hear their story. And um, after that point, I kind of gauge how serious they are about their commitment because we ask everyone for at least six months to commit to the program. And the way I say this is that if you're, for example, running a marathon and you've never run a marathon, it takes you about, if you're fit, you can do it in three months. That's 26 miles in about three months. If you're not fit, it's going to take you at least six months, about six months of training to make yourself available to do the marathon. Now, think about this. We are working on the most abused muscle in the body. So I look at them and say, are you prepared to commit? Are you prepared to, does this fit in with your schedule? And... Um, most of people sort of, if they, if they are made aware that, okay, this is what's required of me, um, they, they commit. Um, but what we tend to find, those people who sometimes um, leave halfway through or after a few months, it's not because they can't commit. It's because things that are unresolved and unevolved that are buried get triggered. And when they come, that can be really overwhelming. So people have this concept of meditation that's all about Zen, it's all about being calm, all about being peaceful. And it is, it takes you to that space. But the things that you've buried, you've got to have a look at them. And so when these things come up, it can be overwhelming. And that's when people sometimes say, you know what, I've done it if I'm ready to deal with this right now. And um, that's where we have few people leaving. But generally, we have a, a reasonably good um, continuation rate. That's fabulous. I mean, that's incredible. And, you know, that's true. That's one of the natures of spirituality or, you know, spending time self-awareness is unresolved stuff is going to show up. And, and, you know, one of the things, the hard things is to be able to be still and be patient to process that yeah. and then overcome it rather than try to resist it. And, you know, this is one saying that I always have been sticking by what you resist persists. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your cancer turnarounds. Um, that is a pretty credible data point. It's irrefutable. If you have medical evidence of the benefit of meditation, who's, who's going to argue against that, right? Talk to us a little bit about that. So would you tell us about the specific, you know, without going into personal details, but just tell us a little bit about the process. And uh, We've had three people who've come. Um, one has been a complete turnaround. One person passed away a few months ago, and the second person, again, she's in the process of remission. But one of the most remarkable turnarounds was this lady who had had thyroid cancer and was having chemo for the best part of 20 years. And here's the interesting thing. So when she came to us, um, after about a year, the cancer went, but then it came back really aggressively. So we're sitting together and after a while you, you get very close when you work with people you get very intimate um and it, it it kind of feels heavy in yourself as well when one of your people is not is um, is suffering but here's the interesting thing so as we sat and she was speaking to me and she said you know what i've got four daughters and i tell them that 
it's okay, you know, uh, that's life and you shouldn't be afraid and this is, things happen in life and you shouldn't be afraid and this is, and she used, kept on using the word, you shouldn't be afraid, you shouldn't be afraid, this is life, this is how life treats you and, you know, this is the way the story goes and I'm listening to her and, I'm, and she kept using the word, you shouldn't be afraid, you shouldn't be afraid. And I said to Isaac, can I just ask you a question? Can we please drop this show? I said, a lion does not go into the jungle and exclaim to everyone, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid. I said, that's it, isn't it? That's it, isn't it? I said, you're afraid. Jay, and that was a moment the doors opened. She had repressed memories for 14 years no memory recall for 14 years and i don't know if you're open to me telling you about some of the memories that came up but it was close to torture some of the memories that she had suppressed and over about five years of working with her there were times when i could see in class that things just coming to the surface and you could see her really feeling unsettled in class. And then we would work with that. And, um, and there were times really when we were in a meditation room and she was shrieking, dealing with um, all the trauma that was coming up. But Jay now, safe to say, she's off medication, she's off treatment. And I wish I could, uh, if you told me before, I could show you the before pictures and after pictures, but she's a real inspiration for all of us. And she, and, and she looked at her fears and it's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to look at um, things that are unresolved and unevolved that you've buried. Mm. Oh, so um, much of, so much of our suffering is psychosomatic and yeah. we don't realize this unresolved baggage that we're carrying around is the cause of our greatest ailment. And, yeah. you know, I don't know how much louder and <laughs> more clear we can be about the role of meditation is to heal. And that's a healing that we all have power to do. And um, yeah, so, so which brings me to the thing, uh, Traher, um, are you trying to say something? Because I want to kind of lead us into that healing process. I, I, I wanted to say, um, and this is really important, that no one puts pain in us. No one puts discomfort in us. They trigger within us what is unresolved and unevolved. And my experience of meditation is that my practice needs to give me the power to be able to open up to that because it's going to be overwhelming. It's going to be overwhelming. And, and that's really what I feel our work with meditation is doing. It's giving people a power to open up to those things that are unresolved and unevolved and being able to work with that. Mm, fabulous. Talking of which, can you help us to go into that space and experience maybe just a very initial stages of healing? I know we only have a certain amount of time here. It's going to take me about, say, 15, 15 20 minutes. Would that, would that be okay? Uh, I, I feel just for all the viewers, one of the, one of the things that is really important, it, it's helped me tremendously. We all know um, how to meditate. You go on the internet and there. There are so many different ways of how to meditate. And if you ask someone why to meditate, they'll also tell you why to meditate. It's, it's, uh, this is, you know, it calms the mind down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you ask people, what is meditation? What is meditation? I tend to find that people are not so clear on the question, what is meditation? And so for that, I'm going to give you an analogy, Jay. And that analogy is going to answer this question. And hopefully we're going to take people into that experience of what is meditation. The way I'd like to start this off is by introducing the concept of meditation through the analogy that we were born as a sky. The sky is unlimited. The sky is open. The sky is abundant. The sky is free. We were born as a sky. The spiritual name for sky is consciousness, is awareness. Now, 
actually, Jay, I'm so sorry. Just give me one second. I didn't realize I'm just um, putting my adapter on. Sorry for this. Okay, thanks. Um, and so the idea is I was born the sky. Now it didn't take long before I began to perceive the world, create thoughts, have experiences. And then, as you know, every thought that I repeatedly have becomes what we call a belief. It's a pattern thought. Thought working through the body with what we call emotion, thought, emotion, thought, emotion creates belief. Now, all of a sudden, these beliefs in the form of clouds are being created in the sky. It doesn't take long before I forget that actually I'm the sky and I become invested in the clouds. Now I'm looking at the world as a cloud or as a series of clouds that we call our beliefs. And so there is this limitedness. I look at people through my beliefs and my experiences and there is no freedom in that. So what is meditation? You see, as a cloud, I'm always generating or creating energy because what comes from clouds, rain. Rain in this analogy is a thought, okay? So all the thoughts that I'm creating are coming from these clouds and every time I'm thinking, I'm generating, creating energy. What do we do in meditation? We take our awareness out of being the cloud into the sky. We go back home we go back to our original face. And in the original face, we are not generating energy. We are gathering the energy that's invested in our beliefs, in our experiences, and we're gathering that energy. Now, what we find is that more we begin to meditate and gather that energy, gather that energy, that energy becomes available to me to respond to life very differently compared to responding from the clouds. Does that, does that analogy make sense, Jay? It's, it's a fabulous analogy. I've heard many beautiful things. This is a, probably one of the best things I've heard from you. I love it. Okay. So the thing is, in a space of about 15, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, how can we get into the experience of sky? Now, for this, there is something else that I'd like to share with our audience. It's really important to know the difference between awareness and concentration. It's a, it's a misplaced idea in meditation that I need to focus and concentrate. Meditation is not about focus and concentration. Actually, it's about awareness. So I'm going to ask you to practice awareness. And the way we practice awareness, I want you simply to open your awareness. So for example, right now, I can hear the AC behind me. I'm aware of the light. I'm aware of the screen around me. There's a... Um, there's a bulb in the background. I can hear a slight buzzing noise. So I've opened my external awareness. I'm not focusing in on anything. If I'm focusing in, if I'm focusing, trying to concentrate, there will be the exclusion of all the things that are getting in my way of that focus and concentration. And when there is exclusion, there's subtle resistance or subtle violence. So we want to have a resistance free space. So the first thing is awareness. I'm fully aware. I'm not focusing on anything. I'm just aware. Now there's an external awareness and there's also an internal awareness. And so internally I'm aware of maybe my thoughts, my emotions, my sensations, my perceptions. So I'm fully aware. 
fully aware. So I'm in awareness, I'm not in focus or in concentration. Now, from this space, we begin our meditation. Now, I'm gonna get a little theatrical with you if you'll, if you'll allow me to just to get the point across. But do you remember, Jay, when you were younger and I don't know if your mother ever said to me, Jay, are you listening? Are you listening? And you'd become alert to listening to your mother or your father. The same thing here. So I'm gonna open this question to the audience and I'm gonna be a little theatrical about this. Are you aware? Right now, if I say to you, are you aware? All of a sudden, you would become alert to being aware. Before a thought comes and carries you away. But that space, when I asked you, are you aware? And you became alert to being aware. There was no thought generation there. There was a sense of stillness. And there you had a glimpse of the sky. You weren't operating from the cloud. You were operating from the sky. So then our next question is, how can we capacity build that experience of being aware? So again, I ask you, are you aware? So you can ask yourself, am I aware? So the next thing is, what is going to take you out of awareness? There are two things that uh, we have found that most of us suffer from or have experienced, and it creeps into our daily life, and it takes us away from a sense of awareness. What is the first thing? The first thing is what we call zoning out. Have you ever had that experience that you're in a meeting, listening to someone, and all of a sudden, you zone out? You'll go somewhere else, you're in some kind of a twilight zone, and then you'll come back. It could be a conversation with someone, it could be a lecture, it could be anything you're watching, you kind of zone out, and then you come back. If you think about it, zoning out, Jay, it's a very deep, everyday habit. And it's probably a childhood defense mechanism when you found your environment to be a little overwhelming or when the big people were maybe having a go at you and you couldn't deal with the emotions, zoning out was a way of disconnecting. Um, you see, the body has what we call a fight and flight response. We all know about that. But sometimes we've also found that those people who've had a lot of emotional abuse or physical abuse, uh, their freeze response is quite strong. And often for them, that is another mode of zoning out. So how do we get over zoning out? Very simple. How do you get over anything? You don't try and finish it. You become alert to it. So if I say to you, I want you to become alert to zoning out, which means become alert that you don't zone out, just become alert. All of a sudden now, you're attentive that you're not gonna zone out, you're just gonna be alert. So I ask you, are you aware? You can ask yourself that question. Am I aware? Be alert to zoning out. Second thing, thoughts are gonna come. They're going to come, and i use another analogy. They're going to come like a surf, like a wave with a surfboard on it. Now, if you get on that surfboard, then that surfboard will take you away, and one thought will lead you to another thought, to another thought. Before you know it, you're lost in an expansion of thoughts. Again, be alert to getting on that surfboard. Thoughts will come. Be alert to getting on that surfboard. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to ask you, we'll do it for a couple of minutes, two, three minutes. We'll do it for one minute. We'll have a few seconds break, do it for another minute. We'll do it two, three times just so you can get a feel for this. 
So I'm going to ask you the question, are you aware? Ask yourself the question, am I aware? You're going to become alert to zoning out and alert to getting on that surfboard. Now, remember, when you become alert to being aware, so you're just aware. In spiritual terms, you may have heard this, some of you, it's called your awareness on your awareness. But I like to use the word being alert to being aware. It's a lot simpler. So it's almost as if I'm alert to being aware is my primary awareness. And in the background, a surfboard may come, but it's in the background and I'm okay with it as long as my primary awareness is my alertness to being aware. Can we try that, Jay? Can we try that together? So we're all going to try this. I'm going to put my watch on for one minute. So we'll try it for one minute. Then, Jay, if you want to ask me some questions, we'll fine tune it a little bit. Try it again for another minute. Fine tune it. So we'll do it about three times to give you an idea, and I'll give you a helping hand as we, as we walk through this meditation. Okay? So start watch on. So the question... Am I aware? Be alert to zoning out. Be alert to that surfboard. Time starts now. Not pushing anything away. alert to being aware. Alert to zoning out. Alert to any surfboards that may hover past. Okay, that's one minute. Now, I'm just going to add one kind of fine tuning process over here. And that is um, in the subcontinent in India and Pakistan, um, young boys and people are probably quite used to flying kites. And so it's not something that we do in the West as much, fly kites. But when you fly a kite, the string of the kite you hold very loosely. If you hold the kite, tautly and strongly, the kite won't fly. So in the same way, when you're alert to being aware, I want you to have a soft awareness. It's not a, a serious focus. It's a soft focus. Yeah? Otherwise, you can, you can really kind of be really intently focusing, but it's a, a soft awareness. Jay, did you want to add anything at this point, or shall I... Should I carry on? Are you good with this? Yeah? yeah continue. Okay. So, guys, soft awareness, alert to being aware, and you realize is that for one minute there's a stillness that is deepening. And this is not something that you're generating with thought. This is not something that you're creating. You're just stopping the habit of noise and traffic and movement that is, let's say, covering the sky. Okay, so let's try it again. For one minute, alert, are you aware? Alert to zoning out, so you're aware that you're not zoning out. alert to the surfboard. If a surfboard comes, I'm not going to get on it.
Okay, that's another minute gone. So the idea Jay mentioned to you earlier on about we do these micro meditations, I tend to find that if we do an exercise like this for 10 minutes, there'll be about three, four minutes of concentration, then about wobbliness. And so you're going back and forth. So what we tend to do over here that works really well is that we call these hit meditations, just a name for fun that we've created. You've got these hit exercises that we made these hit meditations. So the way we go about it is seven one minute drills, just like we've just done right now. One minute break, 15 second break, 10 second break. Again, one minute, 15 second break, 20 second break. Carry on doing seven one minute meditations with a little bit of a break. Do that morning, evening, and if you can in the afternoon. After a few days, you'll find that actually this one minute seems a little bit short. And you find that you can do two or two and a half or three. Now you let go of structure. The structure is only a bit of scaffolding there to get you going. So let's try it again for the final time. And then maybe we can take some questions and maybe we can fine tune some people's um, concerns and questions. Okay, one minute starts now. I would encourage you to open your eyes while you do this. So it's an awareness that you can take into your life rather than making it a closed eye activity. Are you aware? Alert to zoning out. Alert to the surfboard. So you realize that as you do this practice every day, it's not that you're trying to create this concept of peace or calm, but you realize peace and calm is naturally within you and it begins to emerge as you become aware of just slowing the machinery that's just got a little bit out of control and it's running on autopilot most of the time. So this is what we tend to do. Um, so just, it's a very simple seven, one minute thing, one minute drills, three times a day, capacity build it over a week. And then you'll find that you'll be able to be in that state of awareness because meditation is not a practice. It is a state of awareness. So with this state of awareness, you're gonna to begin to see the world as a sky rather rather than that, that myopic view of looking at the world through a, a cloud. I don't know if that's made sense, Jay. Really. Yes, absolutely. No, it's, this is great. So this, so a couple of comments and then a question. Um, and folks, uh, those of you listening, please uh, queue up your questions. There's a Q&A uh, box in the Zoom app. I want you to please put in your questions there so we can try and address as many as we can. So Tahir, my experience, this is, this is the first time I've done this kind of... Um, awareness training, if you will. Uh, so A, it was short, so check on that front. Uh, B, it was secular, so check on that front. But the third thing which came up for me was, it was incredibly dry. You know, it, it, it lacked a sense of heartfulness, which I am used to in my practice. Um, any tips on how to make it? Because if I see myself, okay, you know, for this one minute bursts, okay, great. Like you said, high intensity interval training hit is great, but I cannot see myself being drawn to this like mm -hmm. I'm drawn to my existing practice, which comes from, of course, from a number of traditions. Sure. So Jay, what I tend to find is that some of our meditation practices can be quite exotic. And what they are, they're a creation, they're a concept of thought. 
you are generating thought to create an image or a feeling. And so now I am connecting with something that I have generated, created in my mind, which is again, us connecting with the cloud. You will find something, Jay, about this meditation that I tend to find when you open up this space of wholeness and oneness, which is what this space was, the, per the people that are a little bit more cognitive will look at this space as consciousness. The people that are a bit more heart-based will look at the space of openness and oneness as love. The people that are more artistic will look at this space as beauty. But what you are doing, you are not using your mind to create a concept of peace or love and then connect with that concept. And that's, again, a cloud that you are putting to one side. And so, Jay, what would happen if I, if I can't visualize? There are many people who can't visualize. And there are some people I tend to find that say, you know, my heart is blocked. I, for me, I know for many years, uh, this was blocked and it had to open up. So for those people who can't visualize and they can't, and their heart is not open, and what do they do? So we kind of call this uh, the pathless meditation because it has no path. And yet, it's taking you to the essence of who you are because I am consciousness. Without me trying to open up to that space through something very romantic and very exotic, um, which is nice, but which is the creation of my own mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I get that. I get that. And maybe that is one of the doorways before we get to the state of pure awareness. So maybe that's just like, you know, so we can find different entry points. And yes, I get it. The idea is that ultimately it is the state of pure awareness that we want to achieve. Thank you. So I'm going to um, take some questions from the audience. So the first one has come from Diksha. She's asking, what are your thoughts on being plain aware versus imagined aware, like imagining a point of light in the body? I think you kind of addressed that. Would you like to expand on what you've already said? Um, one thing I tend to find, again, I sometimes use a point of light. Now, we have to be really careful. Firstly, I am creating this point of light in my mind, okay? and I'm anchoring my awareness on this point of light. Now we've got to be really careful here because what is happening in this process? Because sometimes we can get very romantic with this point of light that's cleansing me and healing me and doing all sorts of things with me. But in fact, the idea is that, and it's actually a very useful technique to work with a point of light because when you anchor your awareness on this point of light, again, you'll find that it anchors you, your awareness is not going here or there, and then you're in a process of, of gathering energy. So for me, it's a technique to anchor yourself. And it really helps initially when you're starting off to have an anchor like a point of light. Um, so otherwise you, some people fight, but again, I, I tend to find that doing that one minute thing again, helps people capacity build, or you can use that point of light. Great. So but if, have... again, just to answer the question, just one more thing, you must ask yourself when I'm connected to that point of light, what is exactly happening? Am I using my imagination for the point of light to be healing me and cleansing me, which is again, use of my imagination and I'm creating for it and generating energy. But remember, we started off with our premise of meditation. It's gathering energy. It's not generating energy. Great. I have a question here from Saida. She's saying, we also believe as you do coming from a Muslim family that we want to unify spirituality. We are devotees of the hugging Saint Amma and will hopefully visit her ashram in India this summer. We want to bring unity to all faiths. How do you feel like you are doing this work? Sorry, how do you feel like you are doing this in your work? 
And are people in your work moving to this place? Jay, um, I found that when I first came to Pakistan, just I'd, I'd learned through a lot of traditions um, and I was exposed to a lot of different meditations. And I had to be very, very clear because sometimes some of these meditations were perceived to have a religious bias. What I found over the last few years as you began to develop this practice of your awareness on your awareness, alert to being aware, we see results, people can understand it. And I'll share something interesting with you. When you've got people going into that space of complete wholeness and oneness, I've had people turn and say to me, that's divinity, isn't it? That's divinity, that wholeness and oneness. And it's funny that in Islam, um, the word Allah means no one but one. So we're referring to this oneness. So I tend to find that, and I have people from a Hindu background, a Christian background, a Muslim background, we work with the people across the world. I have never, never heard anyone say that this practice of self-awareness and meditation is, um, is contravening my faith. And there's one more aspect about this that is important. In Islam, Jay, there's a verse in one of the teachings that said, and I think it's actually prevalent in all religions. It says, whoever knows thyself knows thy Lord. Mm. Not who knows thy conditioned self knows thy conditioned Lord. Yeah. And you tend to find that when your conditioning actually begins to fall away as you begin to connect with your essence, with your original face, your connection with God becomes more authentic. You know, uh, this is incredible because, you know, you have been put in a cauldron in a container within your geography of where you live to, to really research and refine this process because ultimately spirituality, we all know, stands above, it's, 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 a, it's above religion. Religion separates us, the way I look at it is religion separates us, spirituality unites us as a human race. So completely yeah. agree and, you know, incredible work you've done. So let's to go to the next question. Luz Elena is asking, what's the difference between being present and being aware? Hmm. Now, um, I can, when I'm talking about being aware and not so much being aware but being alert to being aware. Are you with me? I'm being alert to being aware. Now, that is a connection with my original state of self. That is the sky. I can be very present with you, Jay, having this conversation, and I can listen to you but there's no awareness or sense of self in that connection. Now, if I were to be alert to being aware, if I were to be aware, and from that awareness, Jay, I'm with you. It's a very different space to be with someone. I want to go a little further in what I mean by that. Um, when we work, for example, when people say um, something's been triggered within you and be with it, be present with it. Now, that doesn't work. Why? We know that where attention goes, energy flows. Where energy flows, life grows. So if I've got some, some, something that's been triggered, some sensation within me, and I'm being present with it, I'm actually looking at it from the perspective of cloud. Does that make sense? I'm looking at it from the perspective of a cloud. I'm being present with it. Now, here's what's happening. If I'm alert to being aware, 
and I'm aware of that discomfort, it's in my awareness. I'm not focusing on it, which is what happens when I'm present with something. I'm not focusing on it, but I'm aware. And when I'm not focusing on it, and I'm aware what's happening, I'm drawing back the energy that I've invested from focusing on that. Remember, whatever that thing has been triggered, I have given it lots of attention, lots of thought and emotion over time. So if I'm going to be present with it, I'm just going to be fueling it more and more and more. And so anything that's triggered within me, so if you're going to be present with it, or you're going to be, be with it, you'll tend to find it's going to take quite some time before that discomfort begins to die down. What we've observed is when people become alert to being aware, and that disquiet is in the background, you're not trying to finish it. You're not trying to do anything to it. You're just alert to being aware, which is your primary awareness. That's in the background. And because you're not focusing on it, it begins to power down. It's my attention being present and focusing on something is that keeps it alive. So how can I be, how can I be with it without focusing on it is what this practice helps us to develop. Does that, does that make sense? This is very, very potentially powerful if we understand it. So I'm gonna play it back to you in a, in a, in a context. What you've just shared could be the end of all trauma. Because Absolutely. What, right? So because trauma, what is it? It is something that we are holding in our conscious, our subconscious mind that keeps coming back to be a burden that weighs us down, that doesn't allow us to be quote unquote aware. So let me see if I understand this. You're saying that if I don't feed it any more of my energy, of my attention, I heard you say this, it's going to fade away. Um, if I'm not, if I'm aware, but I'm not focusing on it, my attention is not on it. It's in my awareness. I am aware. I'm not ignoring it. It's, but I'm not trying to finish it. I'm not trying to poke it. I'm not trying to get rid of it. I'm alert to being aware. It's a secondary awareness. When I'm present with something, it's my primary awareness. It's my focus, my attention. And that's actually what what doesn't allow it to, doesn't, uh, doesn't allow um, movement because I'm still focusing on it. So then where is my focus at, or at that point? Where needs to be my focus? I am alert on being aware. I'm just fully in my awareness. My attention is on being alert to being aware, just to be fully in my awareness, not my awareness on. There's a big difference between being aware and being aware on. Having my attention on with something. If I do that, I'm gonna energize a little bit more. So the idea, I'm alert to being aware, just in your meditation, what did we say? The surfboard is secondary. It's not you're alert to being aware, you're fully aware. In your background, your secondary awareness is the surfboard. Now, if I'm focusing on the surfboard, I'm gonna get sucked onto the surfboard and I'm gonna get lost in my, my expansion of thoughts. But that's not who I am. I'm not the cloud. I am the sky. And that's what this meditation deepens. The thing about trauma uh, Jay, that you mentioned, um, we were we were doing this work uh, for a few days ago. I mentioned this on resilience, and I think it's really important to to uh, have a look at this. Is that we were um, exploring some of the emotions um, that many of us are feeling these days. We were think talking about. Um, uh, things like being very unfamiliar, we think about anxiety, things about panic. And what we realized, they were triggering things like helplessness, 
powerlessness, I'm not worthy, I'm not enough. All of these things that impacts my resilience. Now, I ask these people one main question. Now, this is really important, especially when we're doing trauma work, we do deeper work with people. It's not so easy. For example, if I were to say to you, I've had, I had someone say to me, they said, Fahir, I'm aware of um, my helplessness. I'm aware of it. But Jay, awareness is not enough. There's a difference between awareness and realization. Am I realized that it's not serving me? And am I prepared to let it go? Now that level of self-honesty is really important as I'm working with my trauma because I may would not want to let it go. It still may be serving me at some level. So to ask yourself in real deep honesty, are you really prepared to let it go? Are you sure? Are you really ready? And when people realize that, my God, this helplessness has been so much a part of me, who am I without this? So now you realize why trauma is so deeply inset and ingrained. Because we know it may not be ready to let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so going back to meditation, it gives me that power to be able to look at it. If I'm, if I'm alert on being aware, if I'm gathering my power and gathering my energy, I'm aware, but I'm not focusing on it. I'm gathering my energy. Now that energy allows me to work with it, which is not meditation, which is separate. But in my meditation practice, I'm not being present with something. Yes. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. So you're basically, you're, the energy conservation and how you choose to use that energy in your realization thereby transformation is I think what um, is what you're alluding to and which is very, very powerful, yes. Thank you, my friend. I think we've come to the, we have a few more questions and um, I think we just come to be respecting people's time. We've already extended beyond the 45 minutes, but an hour is about perfect, great conversation, great questions, you all. Thank you, keep it coming. Um, I just wanna give a quick plug for tomorrow. We have another incredible coach of mine, a trainer of mine, um, Diane Tillman, she's going to be joining us from Orange County, California. She is the creator of this incredible project called Living Values Education, which was uh, in collaboration with the United Nations Children's Education Fund. Uh, she's put out this beautiful pro program that helps young children develop social emotional learning and skills. And now she even does mindful parenting. So she's going to be the speaker tomorrow. And until I see you all then, thank you, Tahir. Thank you for all of you joining. You. Be well, be positive, and take good care. Take care. Good evening. Bye-bye.